Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Data Governance, Ensuring Trust and Managing Risks, brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law and the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. I'm Charles Strong, the Digital Marketing Coordinator at the Network's National Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. A quick note that both the presentation slides and video playback for this webinar will be available on our website shortly after the conclusion of this event. We strongly encourage attendee participation and would love to hear from you, so feel free to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by using the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen. All you need to do is click on that tab, select all panelists from the drop-down menu, and submit your question. We'll be addressing questions at the end of the event. Your moderator for today's webinar is Sally Malam. Sally serves as the Deputy Director at the Network's Mid-States Region Office, where she provides legal technical assistance on a variety of public health topics. Her current work focuses on HIPAA privacy laws, health information and data sharing, and de-identification. Sally has practiced law for 25 years, um, over 25 years actually, and is a certified information privacy professional with U.S. and government privacy certifications. She has extensive experience in working with state agencies on data-related issues. Sally will be leading us through the rest of today's webinar, so Sally, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to Steve Gravely, although Steve really needs no introduction. He's formerly a partner at Troutman Sanders and focuses his practice in the areas of health law, information privacy, cybersecurity, emergency preparedness and response issues for critical infrastructure industries. Steve is a certified information privacy professional in the United States. He has served as an advisor on numerous initiatives related to emergency preparedness and health information exchange. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Sally. And uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon for some. Good morning for others, perhaps. Uh, I am delighted to uh, uh, be part of this webinar and to have the opportunity to talk about data governance models and some of the interesting developments that we um, <clears throat> that we're all dealing with. Uh, I'm really happy we have such a good crowd for this for this webinar. Uh, this is um, an updated version of a presentation <clears throat> that. Uh, that I did uh, at the uh, Data Summit uh, last fall in de outside of Detroit. And um, so we had some, some information from that and then some new information as well. So we're going to dive right in. Um, we have a, a lot to cover. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, um, it's very, uh, there, it's, it's pretty dense, so uh, bear with me. Um, and I'm glad that the slides and the recording will be available because you may very well want to uh, go back and listen to parts of this uh, again. And we do want to leave some, some time for questions as well. So today we're going to talk about, you know, what is data governance? Why is it uh, important? Why is it vital to interoperability, which is a, uh, a term that has been around now for quite a few years, uh, but it's uh, it's a very important term. Um, I'm going to suggest a data governance framework uh, for you to consider. We're going to talk about um, several current models um, that are being used across the country, and uh, they're all uh, they share some similarities, but they're all a bit different. And uh, we'll talk about those differences, and then we'll spend some time talking about what's what's next. Okay. So what is data governance? Um, the way I define data governance, and, and you may define it differently, but uh, to me, data government really is um, the way that we identify the rules of engagement for, for data sharing, um, and which includes the penalties for noncompliance as well as the oversight of the rules. So. Um, a pedestrian way of thinking about this, I guess, is, you know, most of us, if not all of us, own a car or rent a car and we drive. So, you know, we drive on, on highways, 
that are created for us. We don't build them ourselves, thank goodness. Um, and um, our license to operate is a privilege uh, that we earn and can be taken away. And we drive our vehicles um, following certain rules, speed limits. Um, but, you know, when we come up to a octagonal red sign that says stop, we know it. We know what that means. We come up to a triangular sign that's yellow and probably says yield. We know what that means. Um, and so there are rules of engagement. And then there are, um, there are penalties if you violate those rules. And then there are a number of different governmental and legal institutions that oversee uh, the enforcement of those rules. Well, data governance is similar to that um, because uh, data exchange is very complicated, has a lot of moving parts, um, and, uh, and it doesn't happen by accident. So uh, that's why, you know, governance is important. So technology, and, and we've all, I, I, I've been deeply involved. I've been in healthcare for over 40 years. Um, I started off in hospital administration um, and worked in several different systems and then went to law school um, in the 1980s and then um, have been practicing healthcare law for over 30 years. Um, and for about the last 12 years, I have been increasingly um, uh, focused on uh, digital healthcare, data exchange, devices, interoperability, uh, to the point that two years ago I left Troutman Sanders after a really satisfying career and started Gravelly Group. And all I do now is digital healthcare. Um, and so, I've certainly seen in my in my career um, and just in the last 12 years the fact that EHR technology is ab is absolutely agnostic. It it will transfer data. That's what it does, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't have rules per se, at least not rules about um, what should and shouldn't be done. It has rules around bits and bytes and uh, permissions and access, uh, but no uh, no policy. And so um, today, and this was true a decade ago, um, and it was true in the paper world, but it's just exponentially more of a concern now. Uh, we worry about who has access to PHI um, and who has access to uh, data warehouses that are virtual, that are hosted remotely, and that have um, more data, really, frankly, than any of us can easily comprehend. And we worry about that because of the target that that presents and the risk of what happens if that's disclosed. And so even though the technology is agnostic, um, we need governance to, um, to set rules around how that technology is deployed and how that data is shared. So if you don't remember anything else from today, um, remember the, 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 this, what's in red here, um, that I believe, and I, I, I know a lot of people share this view, that governance is a process. It's not a board of directors. It's not a committee. It's not an individual. It's not a document. Um, it's a process. And um, keep that in mind as we walk through some of the examples uh, that we're going to talk about uh, here in a couple of minutes. So wh why is data governance essential? Well, this map, these two, I've got two maps here um, that show basically the um, proliferation of um, electronic health records. And this, this won't come as a surprise to any of you, and this data is now four years old. Um, from the American Hospital Association, but that's not really important because it, it tells the story. So this first map is um, the um, a, a map of the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, showing the percentage of hospitals that have adopted uh, certified EHRs. And even though there's no key here, uh, dark green is um, 95 to 100%. And so, um, to no one's surprise on this call, um, 
as of 2015, virtually um, every every hospital in the country had some type of certified electronic health record. Now let's flip over to office-based physicians, remembering that this date that this graph is four years old, so the data is at least five years old, maybe more. Um, slightly lower penetration, granted, but but still high, and I would say as of today, um, you'd see a lot more dark green on this map um, with uh, with more recent a more recent uh, mapping, um, and because even for office-based physicians, um, there's a very high penetration of electronic health records uh, in their practices. So. Data governance, it's not, a lot of people think, oh, this is a new thing that's only become relevant uh, recently, or, you know, this must be part of TEPCA, or this must be part of 21st Century Cures, or this must be part of, um, you know, EPIC. <laughs> is this an EPIC plot? Um, and the answer is, data government is not is not new. Um, you know, I've, I've been in healthcare probably longer than anyone else on the, that's in this webinar. And, you know, back in the 70s and the 80s, everything was paper. Um, and then starting in the late 80s and the 90s, we began to get first-generation electronic records. Um, we had fax um, that became ubiquitous around that time. And um, But in that world, uh, every data exchange was point-to-point. -point. Uh, people walked into medical records departments and signed a consent, and they were given, you know, copies of records. They, you sent a fax, and someone sent it back to you, or you had a point-to-point, -point, a two-party data sharing agreement um, that that you negotiated with uh, uh, with your data partner. You knew who they were. You negotiated the contract. Everyone was uh, somewhat templatized, but had its own uniqueness. We lived in a point-to-point -point world, and that was true all the way up until, um, well, it's still true today, actually. We still have a lot of point-to-point -point data sharing agreements. Um, it was certainly true 10 years ago when uh, I had the privilege of working with the Office of the National Coordinator um, to build what is today the eHealth Exchange, and we'll talk about that shortly. But the digitization of data, those two maps I showed you, uh, with the proliferation of electronic records and the fact that we have we now have digital PHI, that really did change everything. Um, because suddenly um, you didn't have to walk into medical records to get your paper record. You didn't have to build point-to-point uh, -point interfaces to electronic, electronically exchange data. Um, the digitization of data and the and the advances of um, technology have allowed um, one-to-many uh, processes as opposed to point-to-point. -point. Uh, you know, clearing houses and um, and gateways and other technical innovations have allowed data to basically um, be anywhere and go anywhere with a click of a mouse. Now. What we, what we learned the hard way was that um, that data wasn't going to go anywhere until the people that controlled it were comfortable that they weren't going to get hauled up in front of the Office of Civil Rights within Health and Human Services for violating HIPAA. Um, and they weren't just going to open up their vaults, um, and I'm using that word intentionally because a lot of people view patient data as, an, as their asset. That's a pretty big public policy debate uh, right now. Uh, but they're not going to open up their vaults to just anybody to come in and mine their data. Uh, and, so, um, and so that's really where uh, my work began in this space 10 years ago in terms of building a trust framework, which we don't have time to talk about today. That's an entire uh, presentation in and of itself. But um, suffice it to say that uh, without, without a trust framework, data is going to stay locked up. 
Um, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. And I imagine everyone on this call has encountered this in their day-to-day -day life. Now, the, the problem with that is, you know, that's very safe, right? If you hold on to your data and, and you're not going to violate HIPAA and you're not going to violate state law, and you might say, well, you know, I'm okay with that. There are a couple problems with that. Um, first and foremost is that um, without data today, it's hard to deliver care. And it's impossible to deliver uh, the best care. And so not having the right data at the right time for the right patient um, will absolutely compromise the, the delivery of care. Um, and more and more, um, it's, it's difficult to, d to deliver any care without uh, access to digital data um, because you're not even sure that, you know, you can rely on uh, the information that you're being given at the point of care. Um, you want to see that validated in a, um, in a record that you trust. And today, based on the maps we saw earlier, those records are electronic, and uh, which gets us into the issues of data provenance and how do I trust what I'm seeing. And then <clears throat> lastly, and it's not on the slide, um, the information blocking rule that um, was uh, part of the 21st Century Cures Act is also making um, the withholding of data um, not just a, a, a bad thing, but probably, potentially, a violation of federal law. So sharing data is, is no longer optional. I would submit that it's essential. Um, and without uh, trust, data doesn't really freely flow. And trust is established through data governance um, and agreements and policies and experience. So that's why data governance is essential. So what about, I mean, how do we think about data governance? Because there are all sorts of shapes and sizes. And I, I'll be the first to say that there absolutely isn't a one-size-fits-all model. Um, because there's not a one-size-fits-all data sharing uh, framework. This is a really complicated ecosystem. Um, 12, 14 years ago when I first sat down with the ONC, and I was, I was a private practice attorney and had been for a long time, um, but I was brought in you know, as an outside consultant to ONC um, in the very early days of the Nationwide Health Information Network, before the DURSA was written, before we had what we have today, and I'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But as we were literally sitting in conference rooms in D.C. talking about uh, this, um, we actually thought that there would be a single um, network of networks for the entire country. Uh, it, it's really almost laughable now, but that's what people who are way smarter than me, I was just a lawyer in the room, uh, people who are way smarter than me you know, thought that would be the, the U.S. model. Well, it hasn't turned out that way. Um, that we have all sorts of models. Um, there's not a single um, a single model today. I'm not sure there ever will be. And and so, um, given that uh, diversity and complexity, uh, it's not realistic to think that there's just a off the shelf one size fits all governance model. I do think, however, we we have a, we have a framework. Um, I love frameworks and. Um, so what I, I do believe that uh, when we think about data governance, we can think about it in the context of principles and structure. The principles being, what do we believe um, when it comes to data governance? Um, are, are, we, um, are we more open access or are we more closed access? Um, are we... Um, are we going to support a wide um, spectrum of uses, or are we going to be more uh, uh, conservative uh, in terms of treatment only? Um, you know, those are principles that, that um, and, and whether we know it or not, we all have them. 
uh, as individuals. And every health information network has a set of principles, um, whether they've thought about it that way or not, um, principles that drive the way they operate. <laughs> and um, and so that's a common uh, that's a common trait across all health information networks and across all data governance models. Is what are what do we believe? What's our what are our core values? And then structure. How are we going to implement our principles? Um, and there are three fairly universal components uh, that I think everybody shares. There are data sharing agreements. Um, there are operating policies that fill in the voids that the data sharing agreement can't fill in because there are just too many of them. And then there's some type of oversight. Uh, maybe it's a board, maybe it's a committee, whatever it is, there's some type of oversight body. And so those are three commonly shared um, aspects of structure. Uh, some, will have, some, are, some networks will have a, a four and a five, um, but almost everyone has one, two, and three, agreements, policies, and, and oversight. So as we think about data governance, governance, even though there's not a one size fits all, I do think this, this very simple framework of principles and structure is helpful. So let's dig down into this just a little bit. Um, and when we think about governance principles, where does the where does the authority come from? If you're a health information network, or a health information exchange, or um, uh, hardly anyone says Rio anymore, um, regional health information organization. Um, but whatever you are, where does your authority come from? Um, if, if you're a if you're a public health agency, then your authority comes from um, uh, your status as a governmental body. Uh, it may be statutory uh, and or regulatory, and so you would be probably a top down um, model where your authority comes from something that is broader th than you are. Um, and and there are plenty of uh, data sharing organizations that. Have a top, that have to, that are top down, not just public health agencies, not just governmental entities, uh, but but there's others. Um, for most of the non-governmental uh, organizations or networks, it's more of a bottom-up approach. Your authority comes from uh, the health systems and physicians and others that uh, are part of your network. And that, that hold the data and that are part of your network, and they give you that authority uh, over them. And so that's more of a bottom-up approach. Um, the, but, but depending on whether you're top-down or bottom-up may well um, inform you, what your governance principles are uh, about how data is shared, who has access to it, et cetera. Another principle is um, um, whether you are, um, and, and this relates to the top-down, bottom-up, if you're a top-down, uh, then you probably have legal authority to require the people in your network to follow your rules. If you're a bottom-up, uh, which most HINs are, um, this is more of a consent of the governed model because the HIN has no legal authority over any of its participants. It only has the authority that those participants give to it. Um, an HIN usually, unless it's a unless it is a quasi governmental body, isn't anointed with any legal authority except what is given to it under the um, bylaws or the contracts that the participants sign. So that's a consent of, of the governed uh, principle. Is your governance going to be representative, or is it going to be more select? Are you going to include all stakeholders, some stakeholders? Um, these are all decisions that have to be made. How transparent will your governance be? Um, it goes, and, and the range is all the way from a true um, public body that's subject to Freedom of Information Act and open meeting laws on, at one end, all the way to a privately held um, 
you know, closed proprietary board uh, that uh, that doesn't have much transparency at all. Now, I want to pause here because I'm not saying that one is good and one is bad. Um, and I'm not saying that, uh, and, and everyone on the call may have their, uh, no doubt has their own preferences for what's, what they what they think is good and what they think is bad. Our job is not to decide that. Um, this is just to say that these are issues that um, you have to grapple with when you are establishing data governance. Um, you know, how transparent are we going to be? Um, or how transparent must we be in order to comply with our state law, our federal law, our tribal law, whatever external laws may govern us. Um, what are the rules of engagement? In other words, um, who can play? Um, who can be part of the data sharing network? Um, who's eligible to, to sign a data sharing agreement? Who's eligible to identify users? What's the credentialing process? Um, are you using digital authorities uh, or digital certificates? Um, you know, what's your, what's your technology model? And how do you make sure that the people that uh, are trying to get data are authorized to, to have it? The, all those are your rules of engagement. What are the purposes uh, for, which you can, um, for which you can exchange data? Is it treatment only? Is it treatment payment operations under HIPAA? Is it, um, um, is it treatment payment operations and other, um, and other purposes? Um, you know, what are those rules of engagement? And then lastly, um, you know, what's the, what's the enforcement mechanism um, for, uh, for folks who don't follow the rules? Whatever your rules are, whether there are 10 of them or 100 of them, whatever your rules are, uh, what's, your, what's your mechanism when someone doesn't follow the rules? Um, do you kick them out of the network? Um, do you have a tiered type of enforcement response where you um, uh, warn somebody, have a corrective action plan, monitor compliance with that, suspend them if they're not doing the right thing, ultimately perhaps terminate their participation if they uh, are unable or unwilling to follow the rules? Um, you know, these are all shades of gray. <laughs> and again, there's no right or wrong answer. These are all choices that have to be made and be, that become part of your governance um, uh, fabric. So once you go through in an orderly way and decide what your principles are, um, and there's a whole process uh, around that, um, then, um, then it's time to memorialize those um, into structures and, um, and documents. So, for example, um, when we talk about governance, are you going to have a, will the HIN, uh, the Health Information Network, will you have a single governing body? Will it be a board of directors for a nonprofit corporation? What if it's a government agency? Is it the agency head? Um, you know, how, is the, how is governance structured? Is there one central governing body, or do you distribute it uh, among various committees or work groups? Um, how, big are, how big is your governing body? Um, you know, and there you have to balance uh, bigger is going to be more inclusive, but bigger is also um, a lot more challenging to manage. Um, it, it's, it's exponentially more difficult to manage a uh, 30 person board than it is um, a, t a 10 person board. Um, and there's plenty of literature out there, you know, that, that supports that. Um, but the 10 person board might not be big enough to be representative uh, to, because there's so many stakeholders involved in, in, data, in data exchange. Um, and I have to say, every time I do this, um, and I'm doing it right now in multiple places, um, we we struggle with this all the time. Um, and um, you know, how big how big do we need? How big is too big? How do we manage a, a, a group that's? How do we get representation? Uh, how do the, because at the end of the day, this is all about adoption. 
uh, and all about trust. Remember several slides ago, I said without trust, the data isn't going to flow. I should have put that in red too, but um, you know, <clears throat> the size of your board actually impacts uh, whether people have trust in the organization. Um, and then once all these decisions are made, and I know I'm throwing these at you really hard, you know, hot and hot and heavy, but you've probably seen a lot of this before. There's a lot of articles that have been written on this in the last 10 years. Um, but once all these decisions are made, then they have to be memorialized uh, somewhere, and that's where um, you know you're, if you're if you're a uh, nonprofit corporation, then you're going to have articles of incorporation in your state, and you're going to have bylaws, and you're going to have policies and procedures. So those are your organizational documents where some of this will be memorialized. You're going to have a data sharing agreement of some sort. Uh, and much of this will be uh, memorialized in that data sharing agreement. You may have legislation uh, or regulations or both that create uh, your data sharing network, um, and in which case some of this will be memorialized there. And, and there could be even there could be other ways of doing it: terms of use, memorandums of understanding. Uh, there's a lot of creativity that that I see around the country in terms of how do we memorialize. Uh, the policy decisions that we are making um, around governing our data sharing network. So <clears throat> I'm now going to shift. So that, that was sort of the theoretical part of the presentation. Um, what I want to do now is shift into uh, a series of examples that talk about how how this, how the process that I've just described has actually played out in in four different um, examples that are currently in place in the United States. So, example number one, the eHealth Exchange. Hopefully, all of you are familiar with the eHealth Exchange. It used to be called the Nationwide Health Information Network. I've alluded to it several times during this call. And um, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a thumbnail history of the eHealth Exchange. Way back in 2005, <laughs> it's hard to believe, um, the Office of the National Coordinator, ONC, <clears throat> decided that um, it, it wanted to um, figure out a way <clears throat> to create a sustainable uh, nationwide framework for um, exchanging electronic health information safely and securely. And the, the first question, um, even before that, was does the technology exist to even support this? And, um, and there, were, there were several years of, of work done by IBM and others uh, to answer that question. And the answer was yes. Um, um, and um, and we don't have that's a fascinating story, but we don't have time to go into it. But then starting about '05, ONC said, "Okay," um, and this was several administrations ago, right? I mean, this is truly this is not a a partisan political issue, which is hard to believe now that anything isn't. But this is going way back into um, you know Bush uh, Bush forty one even. Um, and and so you've had all sorts of administrations, um, both Republican and Democrat, in between. Um, but ONC said, okay, so this can technically be done, but how do we make it happen? Um, and um, so fast forward then to 2009, uh, I, I really got involved about 2007 and with ONC, and then by 2009, we had um, the very first um, live production uh, version of the DURSA, the Data Use Reciprocal Support Agreement, which is the um, multi-party trust agreement that supports um, information exchange for the eHealth Exchange. It was a, um, it's not a two-party agreement. Um, it's a multi-party agreement. It was the first of its kind. Um, no one had ever done anything like this before, and I had the the privilege, and it really was a privilege, of leading the the national work group that created the DURSA. And we had some 
amazingly talented folks from federal agencies, state, uh, government, private sector, um, and many of whom are still around, still doing what I'm doing. Um, many of whom have moved on. Um, and, uh, and so we created this multi-party trust agreement. Um, and, and that was, you know, 2009. And now last year, at the end of last year, um, the e -health, here are some metrics for the eHealth Exchange. You can go to their website and probably get updated. But 75% um, of U.S. hospitals, I think it's higher than that now, is probably over 80. Um, 70,000 medical groups, um, almost 10,000 pharmacies now, I think, well over 5,000 uh, uh, ESRD facilities, um, 60 state and regional uh, health information exchanges, and then um, – a cornerstone of the eHealth Exchange are our federal partners, the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, the Social Security Administration, and CMS. Um, and so that's what eHealth Exchange is uh, today. Now, the um, – I'm having trouble advancing here. There we go. So so what's the governance model for the eHealth Exchange? Um, in terms of our principles, um, probably the most important is a consent of the governed principle. The eHealth Exchange started as a contract activity um, out of the out of ONC. It's um, it's not a it's not a government agency in and of itself. It's not a uh, corporation. It's not you know, the eHealth Exchange is not an it and. Um, which is part of the reason we have a multi-party data sharing agreement. Um, but what that meant was um, there's no federal law that mandates this. There's no there's no external legal authority that created the information health information exchange. Um, there is it was a contract activity out of ONC, and so governance comes from the participants. It doesn't come from any external source, and so in the Dursa. There is a section uh, that creates the governance framework, and uh, and every participant signs on and says, "Yeah, I accept the fact that there that there's this coordinating committee that is the governing body, and here's the list of their powers, and that's that's the only power they have, um, and so that's a pure consent of the governed model. It's a representative body because the members of the coordinating committee rotate." And they are elected by the participants. Um, their meetings are open. Um, any, anyone can participate. They're not all that exciting, uh, so not many people do. But uh, for any participant, uh, they, whether they're on the coordinating committee or not, they, they can they can participate. Um, and um, because we, you know the value for the e health exchange is that transparency is more important than um, confidentiality. And um, and so, but I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It works for the e-health exchange. It isn't going to work for every every data exchange model. And then, um, and then last on this page, but certainly not because it's least important, the quitting committee is accountable to the participants because that's where its authority comes from. And that authority can be, can be revoked. So, you know, so how do those, those principles translate into structure? As I said, um, e-health exchange is not, it's not an it. It's not incorporated. It's not a government agency. Um, the government's, the governance model, the coordinating committee is the governing body, and it, its powers are enumerated in the DURSA. And those are the only powers it has. And in, in fact, um, we just finished a two-year process to amend the DURSA, um, and one of the main reasons that we started that two years ago was because the eHealth Exchange wanted to be able to join other data sharing networks. I remember when I said, you know, 12 years ago, we were all naive and thought that the eHealth Exchange would be the only network. Obviously, that wasn't true. Um, it's it's so untrue that eHealth Exchange is 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 joining other data sharing networks. Well, it didn't have the coordinating committee didn't have that authority 
under the DERSA. It had no authority to sign a um, the Care Quality Connected Agreement or anything else with any other data sharing network. So we had to amend the DERSA to give the coordinating committee that authority. What that means is we have to go through a very transparent and slow process to socialize amendments with the participants, all 260 of them. Um, then we have to put those amendments up for a vote that have to be approved by at least two-thirds of the governmental participants and the non-governmental participants in separate votes. Um, and then all 260, um, currently 262 participants have to sign the new DERSA. Um, and the, the four federal agencies each have their own federal clearance process, um, and the DERSA has to uh, be approved through those clearance processes. So it's a it's a slow motion uh, process. Um, not every data network is like that. Uh, sometimes I wish e health exchange wasn't like that. I'm still general counsel, so I'm really involved in all this. But that's the way it is, and um, and so um, that's an example of of the of governance really being held by. Um, the the participants of the the, the the governed and change being a very iterative uh, process. So that's one model. <clears throat> now let's look at another model, a, a very different model, in fact. Example two, Connect Virginia. Um, Connect Virginia um, is the statewide health information exchange for um, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, this started many years ago um, under the auspices of the Virginia Department of Health, which was a recipient of the ONC grants that most, many of you are familiar with, probably all of you are familiar with, that uh, ONC um, dispensed um, in, uh, after the 2008 recession. Um, you may remember we had a pretty bad recession in 2008 and Congress passed the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act to try and help pull the country out of that very severe recession. Um, and part of that was about $650 million um, being given to ONC to pass out to the 54 states and territories um, to their public health agencies to help kickstart um, health information exchange at the state level. And um, uh, money was doled out based on population. And um, so every state health department um, received its, its share and uh, with the instructions that they were to create a statewide health information network. Most did, some didn't. Uh, probably half of those that were created uh, failed, unfortunately. That's another story. Uh, Virginia uh, is one of the success stories, I'm proud to say, since I am a Virginian. Not the only one, uh, but, but one of them. And so um, it start, this started as a, as a pure government play um, under the auspices and authority of the Department of Health. Um, the, today, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a chronology here in a second to show the transition in governance. Today, um, Connect Virginia is no longer under the authority of the Department of Health. It's in a 501c3 nonprofit corporation, uh, but it has really flourished and it operates um, several different statewide data sharing initiatives. One of the most exciting is a program that was created by the Virginia State Legislature in 2017, um, which is called the Emergency Department Care Coordination Program that requires every Virginia hospital to report real time um, the people that register in their emergency department, and then those registrants are matched against a central data repository um, to see whether or not that individual has a profile in the data repository. Uh, a profile gets created if you frequent ERs um, or if you have a number of other um, it's not just it's not just opioid related. A lot of people think that it's all opioid driven. It's not that at all. There are, there are a number of criteria. We don't have time to go into them. Um, 
a number of criteria that would result in Steve Gravely having a profile in this database. And so every hospital, um, there, there's uh, every hospital has an they they have an ADT feed into the um, into Connect Virginia, technically it's technology vendor, um, and then so all the all the ADT admission discharge transfer uh, records are fed into um, through this uh, very big pipe uh, into the vendor. The vendor has an algorithm that organizes all that data. Then when I show up with uh, meeting some some of the criteria, uh, a profile is created for me. It's hosted by the vendor, and then when I register at a um, an ER outside of Washington D.C., um, there's an automatic query that goes to the database, and boom, I have a profile. There's an instantaneous response back to the ED saying Steve Bradley has a profile. Here's what it is. And again, it's not just opioid. It could be chronic disease. It could be um, I'm homeless. It could be any number of things. Um, so there's not necessarily a stigma here. Um, it's a very interesting program, and and Connect Virginia is now um, uh, running that. Now, the Connect Virginia has a data sharing agreement model on the DURSA. It's called an exchange trust agreement. Um, it's modeled on the DURSA, but it was customized for Connect Virginia. Um, like the DURSA, the Connect Virginia Exchange Trust Agreement is the same for every single participant. And we have, well, let's see, we have um, over 110 hospitals in Virginia. Um, now, we have about six systems, uh, but, um, but over 110 hospitals. And so, and then we have um, thousands of physicians. Uh, we have um, over over a hundred health plans that have signed it. So there's a large number of, of organizations that have signed the Connect Virginia Exchange Trust Agreement, and it's the same agreement for for everyone. Um, and and it's it's um, it's Dursa like in that the agreement itself is. Um, somewhat high level, and then we have operating policies that fill in the voids, which, as you remember, I said that earlier. Uh, and then we do have, we have addenda, you know, because sometimes you have to have, like, health plan-specific provisions or ACO-specific provisions. So we have addenda um, uh, to accommodate, you know, categories of participants. But, but that's how we've codified uh, all of our, all of our principles. So, the reason I, I wanted to talk about Connect Virginia, other than the fact that um, I'm proud of them, um, but they have a very interesting governance history. Um, three distinct phases of, of governance for Connect Virginia. Phase one was um, between 2010 and 2014, really the ONC contract phase. Uh, this was part of the R grant. This was the, the grant that ONC gave to the Virginia Department of Health and BDH then uh, created this 22-member board. Uh, it was chaired by the Secretary of Health uh, for Virginia. It was a public a public body, um, and uh, we followed all the open meeting requirements and all the FOIA requirements. Um, and so it was a very traditional government um, uh, government process. And um, the board was established by the Virginia Department of Health. It was multi-stakeholder. Um, et cetera. So that was phase one of governance. Then, um, beginning in 2014, you know, we all knew, because I was involved uh, all the way back to even before 2010, but we all knew that the ONC grant was going to run out. Um, I mean, it was time stamped, right? Um, and that's why so many of the state HIEs failed once that, once the grant ran out. But we knew that was going to happen. Uh, we knew the month it was going to happen, February of 2014. Um, and so, um, beginning in 2013, um, this 22-member this board developed a transition plan, and we formed a nonprofit corporation, Connect Virginia, 501c3. And uh, beginning in 2014, um, that, that board, the, the, the Connect Virginia continued 
um, without any grant funding um, to operate as a nonprofit statewide HIE with a small corporate board. So it went from a 22-member board to a five-person board. Part of that time, the Secretary of Health was still the chair, um, and part of it, uh, for the last year or so, he, he was not. And the board had the authority that was set out in the bylaws, which was pretty pretty broad, uh, to run the corporation. Now it was nonprofit, and it had to operate within its charter, and it and it continued to have representatives of VDH on the board. Uh, but it was very it was very different. The governance looked very different um, starting in 2014, and that was by design. Um, because this was no longer a government contract activity, this was a private, a public-private activity, but really a private sector nonprofit. So then, in 2019, last June, uh, we entered phase three, and that was where Connect Virginia, the nonprofit corporation, merged into a quasi-governmental nonprofit called Virginia Health Information (VHI). Um, some of you may have heard of it. Most of you probably haven't. VHI was created oh, 15, 20 years ago by the legislature to be a, um, a quasi-governmental um, body to, um, to collect and um, develop uh, data around health care. Um, what, what do I mean by that? Well, initially, their primary focus was um, – to develop utilization, to, to have every to, to 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 implement an annual reporting process for every hospital, every outpatient facility in Virginia to report their how many surgeries did they do, how many CT scans did they do, how many MRIs did they do, how many um, uh, surgery, you know, how many hours of OR time, that sort of thing, which supported the Certificate of Public Need program in Virginia. That's how they started. But then over over the years, they've expanded into patient-centered, a uh, patient-level database, um, uh, all-payer claims database, um, all sorts of interesting performance-related data projects are housed by VHI. And then in 2019, um, the nonprofit board made the decision to merge into VHI to let VHI carry on the mission of the HIE. Why did they do that? Uh, running HIEs is really hard. Uh, there's not a big profit margin, and um, and and the H the nonprofit board said we think that our long-term future is better if we affiliate with VHI and become um, a little bit more governmental. And so the the point of this slide is governance is never static. Governance it can can th these are. You know, the difference between phase one and phase two is night and day, and then phase three is sort of moving back towards phase one. That, that's, that's, a, that's an exemplary of a, of a vital, alive, healthy governance process. So I don't want you to think of governance as something that is a one and done. That's, that's never the case. Uh, governance is organic. Remember I said it's a process, not a board. Um, we get a little bit of background noise, so if you're not on mute, maybe you can go on mute. Uh, governance is not a process. Uh, it is a process. It's not a board. And Connect Virginia is a good example that drives that, that point home. Okay. Let's, um, let's now talk about Pulse. I'm going to talk about the next two more quickly. So Pulse um, is actually a program that uh, – ONC launched in connection with the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response within Health and Human Services, ASPR. And most of you are probably familiar with ASPR. Um, they launched this post-Katrina um, to try to address some of the catastrophe that happened with Hurricane Katrina. Um, most of you probably remember that. Uh, I was heavily involved in, um, in, in that in terms of the public health disaster and the uh, tremendous impact that Katrina had, not just on New Orleans, but on the health system in the, really in the entire southeast United States. Um, and so oh, uh, one of the many things that came out of Katrina was a recognition 
that disasters um, uh, will often result in people being displaced. And um, for people that have health, health conditions, not necessarily caused by the disaster, but chronic health conditions, um, you can have a medical disaster following the natural disaster uh, because people are separated from their delivery, their, their care network, uh, their support network, their medications, their devices, and, and their records. And um, for those of you who have done, a, you know, a, a fair amount of emergency preparedness work as I have, you know, this notion of alternate care facilities or alternate care sites will resonate with you. Um, where you bring in volunteers, whether it's DMAT or, um, or true volunteers, um, and um, you know, setting up setting up sites in parking lots or at airports or wherever it may be, um, and seeing people that you, know, you have no no idea who they are, and um, you know, it's 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 very much you know, uh, it's not even battlefield medicine because uh, battlefield medicine you you at least have some idea who the person that you're treating is. Um, and they're going to have, these days, they're going to have some type of uh, basic information on their, on their person. Um, you, we didn't have that in, in, these, in these cases. Uh, this is reminiscent of when I was running fire and EMS in the 70s, and you rolled up on someone and you had no earthly idea um, what was going on. And you, you were totally flying by the seat of your pants. Um, so, um, so ONC said, and Asper said, you know, well, we got to do better than this. And so um, they created this PULSE program, uh, Patient Unified Lookup System for Emergencies, is what it stands for. And, um, and they have, there's a vendor, Audacious Inquiry, a uh, very well-known uh, digital health uh, IT consultancy that uh, worked with ONC and Asper um, and developed uh, software, some of which is open source, some of which is proprietary, um, and and uh, to, to to support to try to to fill this void, right? To try to fill this gap, because this doesn't have to be a Katrina-style um, widespread catastrophe. It should be. Um, it doesn't have to be an earthquake in St. Louis. Um, it, it should be um, much more localized. Um, and uh, in fact, it was deployed during. Uh, in 2017, um, in the California wildfires, um, and it was deployed again last year um, in the California wildfires because people are uprooted on short or no notice, and they run out of their homes to keep from being burned alive, and they leave uh, everything in there. It's, it's horrible, uh, but that's part of what Pulse was designed for, and has actually been activated in. So. Uh, you know the tool was built. Um, not e it's not easy, but but the tool was built. But then the question was, well, how do we actually roll this out? Um, and um, public health agencies um, and public health authorities had the desire and the commitment, but didn't have the resources, because as we all know, public health is chronically underfunded. Um, and and so ONC was was turned to Sequoia. To e health exchange really, um, and said, "Hey, can you help us? We've got this technology, we've got a program, um, but we need governance, and and um, we don't want to stand up something brand new." So ONC turned to e health exchange, and and e health exchange said, "Yeah, we'll take we'll take this on." And so Pulse is now a program. If you go to the e health exchange website or the Sequoia Project website, you'll see Pulse. And and so Pulse is uh, uh, eHealth Exchange doesn't own Pulse. The Pulse is owned by um, the state or regional governments. Um, there are a number of states in the Gulf um, and California. Um, that's obviously not in the Gulf, uh, but California plus a number, bunch of Gulf states um, have implemented or are in the process of implementing Pulse. And um, the program is owned, and I'm using air quotes. Um, by either the state or regional government as part of its emergency preparedness and response infrastructure. The, the software, as I said, is um, part open source, part proprietary, pr provided by uh, Audacious Inquiry. Um, and the data sharing 
uh, you know, connecting the wires is something that eHealth Exchange has in place through through the eHealth Exchange network, and the, and and also has some governance. And so eHealth Exchange hosts Pulse, but doesn't own Pulse. And so it's a multifaceted um, governance model, which is why I find it interesting. And um, so it falls under the general corporate oversight of um, eHealth Exchange. But then uh, ONC is involved in governance. There's an advisory council, uh, which is largely staffed by state and regional customers of Pulse um, that has broad authority. And so this is yet a different governance model um, that um, um, is intended to show um, how creative you know people can be in terms of uh, private sector, public sector working together to bring a digital health technology resource uh, into into creation. And then my last example is um, is really more of a use case. Um, Electronic case reporting, ECR, um, which is also very public health focused. Um, so today, as most of you all know, um, states, some localities, some territories uh, have, um, have mandatory reporting, uh, mandatory conditions or mandatory diseases that have to be reported. Um, and, and they vary from state to state and sometimes within a state, by locality to locality, what has to be reported for whom varies. A lot of this now is paper-based, um, and um, or it's not being done at all, <laughs> and um, which is even worse. And so um, the, uh, there's been work done, um, there's been work done going back many years now to try to digitize this entire process. And um, and there are a lot of very important stakeholders involved in this um, that that have done some great work uh, in this in this area, um, including Robert Wood Johnson and the uh, Council for State and Territorial um, Health Officers and um, ASTO and the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists um, and and um, the the um, American Public uh, Health Laboratory um, Group. And so this is, um, I'm offering this up to show yet another type of governance um, that's really unique from the other three. So APHL, um, American Public Health Laboratories, is a nonprofit, um, probably known to most of you, um, and they created this informatics messaging service uh, which is proprietary software that they own. It's called the AIMS platform. And um, APHO worked with the CDC and with CTSE um, and, or CSTE, sorry, and others uh, over uh, a long time, over, over 10 years, um, and, uh, and developed <clears throat> this technology <clears throat> that would, um, that would support um, electronic reporting. Initially, the reason CDC got into it is to try to improve the quality and quantity of flu reporting. But the technology is agnostic, as I said very early on. Uh, technology is agnostic. So once the tool was created, um, my good friend John Loons, who was a national coordinator, um, um, and many other smart people said, you know, we can use this for a lot of other stuff. And um, and that's how the ECR program was really uh, started. So um, fast forwarding then, if I can make my mouse work. Um, huh. Well, come on, Steve, you can do this. There. Um, so today, the AIMS platform isn't just flu-related. It actually can support um, uh, uh, data exchange um, between uh, state uh, and local public health um, uh, authorities, the CDC, and private sector organizations like hospitals and doctors, which is the source of, of these reports because they're the ones treating the patient. 
And these are all the use cases that, as of late 2019, the AIMS platform supported. You know, vaccines, um, laboratory reporting, um, vital vital records, vital events, immunizations. Um, so it's a very robust um, software capability that has been built out by APHL in conjunction with its partners. Um, let me go back. I'm sorry. So, you so why is that up here? Okay, well, the reason this is up here um, is because um, this is a fantastic tool and a fantastic technology, but they, but they, APHL was um, running into some pretty serious challenges back in 17 and 18 trying to deploy this because um, they were faced with having to build out their own nationwide network and do their own data sharing agreements and their own business associate agreements. And um, the lift of that was simply uh, too much. And so eHealth Exchange started talking with Dr. Lunsch and others um, about leveraging the um, infrastructure that eHealth Exchange had um, to try to accelerate the rollout of this fantastic capability. But there was concern about um, about AIMS and APHL and this, you know, uh, public health being lost in you know the pretty big e-health exchange, and so um, and so the, the way we worked that out is that um, electronic uh, case reporting is another um, program that e-health exchange supports. Uh, but doesn't doesn't control. Um, there, it, it's controlled through APHL and through their stakeholders who make the governance decisions. But it's housed within the eHealth Exchange, and there's um, high-level coordination between APHL and eHealth Exchange. And so, this is yet a different governance model um, that that. Um, that shows that there are many ways to approach governance. There's not a single right way. There's not a single wrong way. It's simply a, you know, different ways of approaching governance um, in order to try to take advantage of technology. Okay. So let me now segue quickly to TEFCA. I was asked <clears throat> to do an update on this, and I will do it as rapidly as I can. This is this is somewhat governance related, I suppose. Um, but it, it is governance related. So, um, and forgive me for not updating. This should be five. So, what is TEFCA? TEFCA stands for Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. It was part of, or it is part of, the 21st Century Cures Act, passed by Congress in 2016 signed by then President Obama in December of 2016, so it's just over three years old. And uh, Cures was a massive piece of legislation that did a lot of stuff, but the TEFCA part of Cures really was designed to try to create a single on-ramp, um, which may sound familiar, a single on-ramp to promote nationwide interoperability. It may sound familiar because remember when I said uh, 15 years ago, we were sitting around Washington saying, well, let's have a network of networks. Um, now, this is different. This is not going back and plowing that ground, but this is saying um, despite all the resources uh, that we have been poured into this, we're still not, we still haven't achieved, Congress said, we still have not achieved the level of interoperability that we want. And therefore, we're going to um, empower the offices of the national coordinator uh, to create um, this trusted exchange framework and common agreement. It's very controversial, um, or it was. I think it's less controversial now. Um, but the office of the national coordinator has published a lot of proposed rules on this. And last August, uh, after a um, open public procurement process, uh, ONC selected the Sequoia Project uh, to serve the central coordinating role 
for uh, developing the common agreement. It's we're called uh, Sahoya is the recognized coordinating entity RCE, and it has a contract with ONC, uh, and that contract um, uh, requires the Sequoia project to develop the common agreement, the CA part of the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement over the next um, year or so. And uh, I, of course, am general counsel to Sequoia. I am part of the RCE team. Um, I'm driving the, the legal side of the, of the house um, and contributing on the policy side of the house. Um, and so the slides that I am now going to present to you are ONC slides that have been approved by ONC for me to share with you because we have used them publicly. Some of you may have seen these because we've been doing public health stakeholder engagement sessions, uh, but there are four of them that I want to walk through quickly. Uh, the goals of TEFCA, I've already talked about this, I think, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to repeat it um, because we're getting close on time. Um, the next slide uh, is, dang, man, this is really bothering me uh, in terms of advancing these slides. Ah, so what are the benefits of TEFCA? Um, I, I, there are lots of them. Um, you know, ONC uh, believes that, that for public health, which is the third circle down, um, that this really is going to help public health um, and other state programs in a meaningful way. Uh, by um, trying to take some of the burden off of public health to create their own um, data networks and highways. Um, I hope that's true. Uh, I think it will be true. Uh, but there are lots of other benefits to TEFCA um, uh, to participating in the, in the framework and signing the common agreement. So I was asked to talk about, you know, what have we accomplished so far since uh, August of 2019? And we've actually accomplished quite a bit. Um, so in year one of the, of the grant, which is August 19 to August 20, um, we'll be dealing with, you know, planning a ramp up, which we've already done, engaging key stakeholders, um, which we are in the process of doing. That's an ongoing process. Developing the common agreement, uh, in other words, writing a um, data sharing contract, um, that part of which ONC has written for us and is published for public comment, a part of which uh, we, being the Sequoia Project, are responsible for drafting. Um, and then another part of what um, we will be doing is the technical framework uh, that will support the exchange of information. Um, again, ONC has done a high-level draft of that, but Sequoia um, will be taking that and, and making it um, uh, finalizing that into something that will support um, the framework, and then um, and then coming up with the entire process from soup to nuts for the organizations that will sign the common agreement. They're called QHINs, um, Qualified Health Information Networks, the people who will sign the common agreement, including the um, application process, the vetting process. Um, monitoring them, enforcement of violations, et cetera. And then beyond year one, there are all these activities, really which are focused on supporting an operational um, national network. Um, so what have we done so far? Um, you can see here what we've done. Um, we we uh, Sequoia received a grant um, on the 29th. It was announced publicly right after Labor Day. Uh, we had a kickoff meeting with ONC. We launched a website that's publicly available at the end of September. Um, early October, we had our public kickoff call. The technical side ramped up around Halloween. Um, and then we, the RCE, have been working with ONC um, to discuss the uh, the contract terms that it drafted, really the policy decisions that ONC made, which is the type of governance. Um, remember, governance is what do you believe in? What are your principles? Well, you could substitute policy for principles, and ONC has very definite ideas about policy. And that's why it wrote and published a set of 
minimum required terms and conditions in order to be sure that its policy was articulated. And we've been working with ONC on that to um, clarify things, to consider public input. And at some point, there'll be a, a new version of those uh, terms published. And then we've been engaging uh, stakeholders. And soon, we will be engaging a common agreement work group, um, probably starting around March, to really sit down, roll up their sleeves, and work with us on drafting the first generation common agreement that will then be put out for public comment through rulemaking, um, probably in the fall of 2020. Um, the, the common agreement is, it's a contract, okay? It's a legal agreement, it's like the DURSA, it's a legal agreement. It has three components, the minimum terms, the MRTCs that reflect ONC's policies, decision, the ARTCs, which are other terms that are important for a contract, and then the technical framework. It will be a single legal document, the QHINs will sign it, um, and then some of those terms, the QHINs will flow down to their, to their customers. All right, so I'm sorry that I went on so long, I wanted to have more time for questions, but everybody says to me, well, where do we go from here? And, and, and so this is my distillation of where we go from here. Um, there's no longer any debate about whether we should be sharing data uh, or whether we should be sharing data at scale uh, nationally. That, we're past that. We passed that uh, a few years ago. Um, anybody involved in the delivery of care or the delivery of health services, whether you're public or private, whether you're government or private sector, um, data sharing is mandatory. Um, the information blocking rule, which we haven't had time to talk about, um, which we expect will have a final rule in the next few weeks on that, that will be transformative. That's going to break down a lot of silos that still exist where data has been locked up, um, either for proprietary reasons or for well-intentioned but misinformed reasons. Um, and, um, and the information blocking rule is going to change that. So there'll be even more data available. Um, and so in this, you know, the, the analogy that, that I like to use is, you know, we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a typhoon in a 10-foot boat. Um, it's not easy to survive. Um, and all, all that ocean is very important. Um, it drives our uh, care delivery and care management systems uh, but it's also dangerous. Um, those 40-foot waves are dangerous. And, uh, and I'm not even a sailor, so I probably shouldn't even use the analogy, but I think it fits. Um, I am convinced um, that public health is absolutely essential to a healthy ecosystem. And um, I know that Marion Yeager, the CEO of the Sequoia Project, shares that view. Uh, we are actually passionate about public health being at the table. It's hard for public health to be engaged uh, often. And so, um, and so, but what I think is next is um, things are gonna look different than they, than they ever have before. And we've passed the point um, of debating whether it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Um, it's happening around us now. These are very exciting times and I'm excited to be in the middle of it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sally. Um, and let her take the next 10 minutes to see if we can tackle some questions. Thank you, Steve. Before we get to the questions, I'd like to just take a moment to talk about all-in data for community health. The Network for Public Health Law is a national partner with the all-in. All-in is a learning network of communities that are testing ways to systematically improve community health outcomes through multi-sector partnerships working to share data. All-in partner networks are building the evidence base to advance practice, identify gaps, highlight investment needs, and inform policy. The All-In online community is a social platform for All-In data for community health and includes an online membership that gives you access to new and daily weekly content in addition to technical support calls focused on helping you navigate the platform, make new connections, and find relevant resources. 
For example, we are running short of time today, but All In has started a discussion post, which I've just um, put in the chat. So I see a number of the participants today are All In members. Please go to the chat and um, feel free to discuss what you're hearing today around governance or maybe the webinar next week. If you're interested in joining All In, it's free. Go to allindata.org. Also want to tell you on the next slide about our affinity groups. We have a number of affinity groups, including navigating law for data sharing that you might be interested in. So one more thing to tell you about All In. We heard today about the web, about governance in this webinar, and it gives us a strategic view on interoperability and um, helps us understand how it advanced data sharing. Join us on Thursday on an all-in webinar to explore data sharing at a different level where we look at legal structural barriers to data sharing and how we navigate those barriers by obtaining consent. So in a moment here, I'm going to post information on the Thursday webinar and hope you can join us. So now we're going to turn to the Q&A. We have questions and instructions on the screen. I'll be looking at the questions in the chat and then posing them to Steve. We really encourage everyone to uh, feel free to ask your question and um, look forward to hearing from you. So. I'll look at the first, one of the first questions have, I have here, Steve, and it is about, let's see, engaging private industry is a challenge because they are concerned with proprietary interests. Any suggestions for states to consider as they are desiring to evolve their governance model? Yeah, I, I so. Think when, um, I, I think it bounced around, I'm sorry. Let's see. I started reading one question and then hopped to the next. Let's see. Here we go. Any advice for engaging private industry due to their concerns with proprietary information? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, that. that. My advice is um, to the private industry um, to respectfully ask them to reevaluate um, what's really proprietary, um, because I think that um, in some cases um, <coughs> that people think that you know data is their most important strategic asset, um, but is that really true, uh, and should it be true? Um, and I think the information blocking rule is going to turn the world upside down uh, because it's going to require people to share data that today they aren't sharing. Um, and you can look at the congressional record on that, and it's a pretty scathing indictment um, of, of of this fact. Um, and that's come, and I'm saying that as uh, as an apologist for uh, the healthcare industry. Um, so I would say. Um, um, say to people, look, you know, we we appreciate that you know your R and D is your is your proprietary data, but uh, patient data isn't your data. Um, you know, it belongs to the patient, and the fact that you've accumulated it, um, you, you may own the format, you may own the record, but you know, it's not it's not your asset. Um, now there was some pushback on that, maybe a lot. But you won't be a, you won't be alone in the wilderness. You've got the information blocking rules to back you up, and um, we're going to be seeing a lot more uh, focus on that in the months and years ahead. Okay, is there a list of standards that an organization's legal department can look to as a starting point for creating policy and legislation that builds a supportive data sharing environment? Um. No, there's not a single go-to list. I would say that um, you know you can um, you can um, look at um, 
you know, you can certainly look at the eHealth Exchange, uh, which is all public and open source and everything else. The DERS is published. All of our operating policies and procedures are published. Um, some states do that as well. So, you know, there is a, there's a lot of information to parse through. There's no single, you know, comprehensive soup to nuts list. Um, there are plenty of articles out there that people have written. I haven't read them all. Probably some books that people have written. Um, that, that would be the best thing I could do, you know, and, and feel free to contact me offline um, and ask me questions. Um, but uh, and I'm happy to, you know, chat with you um, about it. But I would say within the scope of this call, that's probably where I would start. Okay, and I'll just make a plug for the Network for Public Health Laws website under the topic of data and information sharing. I know we have a number of examples as well as our resources resource that we co-host with DASH and all in um, called Legal Bibliography and you can get to that from our website. So another question, Steve, do you have any examples of data governance that's community driven and community owned, particularly in underserved and overstudied communities? Um, underserved and overstudied. <laughs> Not sure about that. Um, well, community-owned implies, to me at least, a local, um, a, a locality. And um, I would say that um, certainly Connect Virginia. I, I would say it's community-owned uh, because it's it's non it's nonprofit, and now that it's part of VHI, it's quasi-public. Um, at the statewide level, there are, you know, uh, there are uh, IHI in, in uh, Indianapolis. Um, you know, John Kansky, who's the CEO, uh, is a former chairman of the coordinating committee, um, one, of the, one of the leaders in this space. Uh, IHI is a good example of, of, a, of a regional um, HIE. Um, there's a group out of, uh, out of uh, the Northwest called OCHIN, O-C-H-I-N, um, another stalwart. They, they, uh, Paul Matthews, the CEO of OCHIN, has been um, on the coordinating committee for a long time and served in many other capacities for uh, the Sequoia Project. OCHIN is nationwide. Um, I mean, I think there, there are probably lots of examples. Um, the... Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, I'm within the time constraints, that's all I can do. But, yeah, there are plenty of examples of successful efforts around the country. Okay. And I see we're getting down to 329. I think I need to pass it back to Charles. But for others who want to continue the conversation, please hit that discussion post that I sent out to the All-In platform earlier. Charles? Great, thank you, Sally. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your participation in today's webinar, and of course, to Steve for presenting today. Um, just a few final notes to all of our attendees. You will be receiving an email from the network with the video playback to this webinar, as well as a link to our brief webinar survey. Um, it takes just a minute to fill out and provides us with some great insights, especially in regards to what topics you would be interested in for future webinars. <clears throat> You will also be receiving an email from ASLME with information on how to apply to CLE credits for this event. And finally, this webinar was a concurrent session at the 2019 uh, Public Health Law Summit. So if you enjoyed this webinar, then please go register for the 2020 Public Health Law Conference happening this September in Baltimore. You won't want to miss it. And finally, uh, to those who submitted questions that didn't get addressed yet, I will be sending these questions both to our moderator and to our uh, presenter today so that, um, you know, they'll be able to, to contact you about them. So thank you all. That concludes today's webinar, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.